So the synopsis for this particular uh, midterm, the three things, there's, there's three chapters we're focusing on. One is uh, the conjugated pi systems. The next one is the aromatic systems, and then finally, the reactions of those aromatic compounds. Uh, and we're also looking at the reactions of these pi systems. So what's the synopsis? The synopsis is we're talking about uh, systems with carbon-carbon double bonds, pi systems. We have to realize that we mostly talk about uh, chemistry in terms of Lewis structures as organic chemists. But superimposed on top of that are a couple of quantum theories that we're always talking about. They're actually, the, they come from the same quantum theory, but we talk about valence bond, and this is a localized bonding model. This is the one where we take atomic orbitals, the s orbitals and the p orbitals. Uh, because we're organic chemists, we mostly just deal with s and p orbitals. But to explain the geometry of the molecules made, we hybridize those orbitals by mixing them up. But we're taking atomic orbitals and we're mixing them together to make new atomic orbitals that explain the tetrahedral arrangement, okay? Uh, and then we talk about how we can take those things. So we make things like uh, sp3, sp2, sp orbitals, all right? These are tetrahedral, trigonal planar, and linear. If we take a look at our organic molecules, we have things like That's sp3 hybridized, it's a tetrahedral arrangement of atoms. Then we have things like this. Uh, I'm gonna draw it this way. These are sp2. Our carbons are uh, planar. They point to the corners of an equilateral triangle. It's planar. Now, in order to explain this, there's something that's missing. They're sp2 hybridized, but we're using these leftover p orbitals that are on those because we only use two of the p orbitals to make them sp2 hybridized. And that's what's making that second bond. We have one bond that's made by the overlap of the sp2 orbitals. And then we have this pi bond, okay? And then of course we have linear systems where we have this. These are sp hybridized. That means there's two p orbitals left over on each of the carbon atoms and we can explain the second and the third bond as being these pi bonds, okay? So now let's just talk about the pi bonds. So in our valence bond theory, uh, we hybridize and we make these first sigma bonds with those hybrid orbitals. Now, after the sigma bonds, we have to make pi bonds. We're using these p orbitals. And when we make the p orbitals, we're actually, we always use a little bit of molecular orbital theory in valence bond theory, but because it's localized, uh, we don't use these great big molecular orbitals. There's another theory called MO theory. And it's not localized. It's powerful. But it's unwieldy. It's difficult to get into great big systems, it gets very complicated. It works very well, but it's very complicated. The nice thing about the valence bond theory is we don't have to get into these big complicated systems. We can model it, we can think about it, 
as localized bonding, so we just worry about what's going on at our bonds of interest, okay? But we have to pull in a little bit of MO theory because when we make these pi bonds, we make them with our leftover p orbitals. We have these p orbitals, they have a lone pair, they have a, a, a electron in them, in the atoms, let's say. But then we mix them because they're a wave equation, they have phase. That's all that shading is indicating is the phase of the wave equation. Uh, and when we mix them, we can mix them in such a way that we mix them uh, uh, together in phase. To make a new orbital, we call this a pi orbital. And we also mix them together out of phase. And we call this a pi star orbital. This one is bonding. This one is anti-bonding. And that explains our carbon-carbon double bonds. When we take these two electrons, because we've made these new orbitals, and when we mix them together uh, in phase, it's energetically favorable, and the new orbital is lower in energy. We talked about this as being non-bonding, where we started. It's somewhat arbitrary, not completely arbitrary, but somewhat arbitrary. Uh, so once we make our new molecular orbitals, we took these, we mix them together, we take both of those electrons and we put them in here. Both electrons are going into a lower energy state. That's favorable. The electron density is contained between the two nuclei. So those two electrons in that are holding the nuclei together. That's what a bond does, okay? We don't put any electrons up here because we're out of electrons. If we did, they would push the nuclei away because they're anti-bonding. And if we think about these, how we draw these orbitals, here's our two carbon atoms. This is a better representation. There's our phase. Most of our electron density we see is in between those two orbitals. It's holding, or I'm sorry, in between those two nuclei. It's holding them together in the anti-bonding orbital up here. This is the pi. pi star, now if we put our electrons in there, they're on the other side of the orbitals, they're pulling the two nuclei apart, so they're anti-bonding. But what's powerful about this is we put our electrons in bonding orbitals, it holds the nuclei together, okay? That's all well and good, this is, this is a uh, little bit of MO theory that we just throw in on top of valence bond theory to explain what happens with those leftover atomic orbitals and how we make pi bonds. So we can always take uh, our sp3 orbitals and overlap them. And we can also make a, this is a sigma bond. And up, way up there, we have a sigma star bond, which we won't bother about because we're mostly worried about bonding orbitals. And this is the first sigma bond that we make, okay? So when we have a carbon-carbon bond, we have uh, electrons in a, two electrons in a sigma orbital that are holding those two nuclei together. That's one of the bonds. And then we have two electrons in our pi bond. That's the other bond. So we have two bonds holding those nuclei together. Now all this chapter is about, so that was a very quick synopsis of stuff you already know uh, to some extent. And I know people have greater or lesser comfort. That's all stuff we talked about in first year. And I don't think we fully understand it. That's why we introduce it to you again in second year, 
uh, in the first half, and now we're introducing it to you again because these are somewhat concepts that are a little bit difficult to grasp. But we have these bonds. A bond means that we have an orbital between nu two nuclei. We have two electrons in that orbital that's holding the two nuclei together. We have a double bond. We have uh, a sigma bond, and then we have a pi bond. We have electrons in a pi orbital, too. If we have a triple bond, we have another pi orbital, which would be at 90 degrees to that first pi orbital. Now, all we're talking about is if we have a system that looks like this, here we have two isolated pi systems. They don't interact. They cannot communicate. They're too far apart. Uh, the elect this, this pi bond doesn't know the existence of the other pi bond. Uh, they don't affect each other's inner energy levels very much, okay? But as soon as we have conjugated systems, this system now, five carbon system, but I now have my pi systems all together. This is a conjugated pi system. And when we get to the conjugated pi systems, they affect each other. So over here, we have two pi systems that are bonding, right? They're favorable, they're bonding. But over here, we have two pi systems that change the energy levels of each other. So now, we take all of our p orbitals. So these are all sp two hybridized, these carbon atoms. That means they all have p orbitals. Those are what interact. Those are what interacted to make our pi systems with just our carbon-carbon double bonds. But now, what we're going to actually find out is the fact that these two things, uh, these two pi systems, now interact with each other. And so, instead of having two isolated pi systems, that remember we had uh, we had. Here's our two pi systems. Okay, and they also had pi star orbitals. thing way over there we have two pi systems and they don't interact they're just two separate carbon carbon double bonded systems that don't interact but now when we get to a conjugated system I'm gonna have to erase so let's just put this isolated system, however, they can interact because there's nothing separate them. The conjugated system
I should just put this up on because I have it on the slide, but I'm going to draw them all because you guys need to be able to draw them. And don't worry, I know I'm a terrible artist. Many of you are better. The way they interact now, we have pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, and pi 4. And I'm going to put stars by these because these are both anti-bonding. There's our non-bonding level. Because they're conjugated, they interact with each other, and we have uh, our two systems combined. The, those four orbitals now recombine to make four new orbitals, two of which are bonding because they're below the non-bonding level, two of which are anti-bonding. And in this particular instance, we have two electrons in this system. two electrons in this system. We have no electrons up there. In this new system, we have two electrons here, two electrons here, both in bonding orbitals, but we don't have any electrons up here, okay? Now, a couple of consequences of this, and now let me bring up the So take a look in there. There's our isolated pi system that we made. That's just a normal pi system. Down here now is our conjugated pi system. Okay, over there, and I also have it over here. A couple of things about this pi system. Number one, that bond between C2 and C3 in our conjugated system has some double bond character. And we see that because down here, we have two electrons. There's bonding interaction between carbon two and carbon three in this MO. Now there's not bonding interaction here, but there is further bonding interaction here, okay? So that C2, C3 bond is slightly shorter than we would predict if those two systems did not interact. And overall, our energy is lower than it would be if we had the isolated systems. We talked about the fact that there were experiments we did that showed that there's uh, these conjugated systems are more favorable energetically than when they're not conjugated, okay? So uh, that then is kind of the whole concept of the conjugate systems, and we can extend that further. If we have six atoms in a row, all with p orbitals that can, all in a row, they can all interact, and then we have a, a even more uh, elongated conjugated pi system. And we can go on and on and on. As long as there's, those p orbitals are next to each other, we talk about it being conjugated. So we need at least three atoms to have a conjugated system. And we make all these different MOs. The important thing is these are bonding and have electrons in them. And these are anti-bonding. They don't have electrons in them unless we do something to get them there. We have to put energy in. We can do photochemistry. Uh, we can really, really heat them a lot. Uh, and then they display different, much more reactive chemistry. Okay? So then, what are the consequences of this? And for this particular section, one of the things we're trying to get across is all of our reactions in this uh, course pretty well. Uh, a few exceptions, we do a few radical reactions. They all involve nucleophiles and electrophiles. Sometimes they're just normal acid-base reactions, but in an acid-base reaction, the proton is the electrophile and the base is the nucleophile, okay? So in, but we often talk about other reactions where a nucleophile and electrophile don't involve proton transfer. The proton transfer is just uh, an, a, a special sort of electrophile, nucleophile reaction. And what we're always doing, what we're representing with these curly arrows is a pair of electrons come from a homo
That's always where we start. Our electrons in an occupied orbital are attacking an unoccupied orbital. I say attack. Okay, so that's all we're doing with these curly arrows. We're, we're showing the electrons in the highest occupied molecular orbital of something see an unoccupied orbital either on the same molecule or in another molecule, and they just kind of try and invade that space. It causes a bunch of stuff to happen in terms of mathematics. We reorganize the, the wave equations, but we always have this happening. We always have nucleophiles attacking electrophiles, bases attacking uh, protons, okay? So that's what these talk about. And when we think about the reactions that we do, for example, uh, happening here, the first step in this reaction is just the electrons in this HOMO pull off a proton and protonate, and this thing, the electrons in that HBr bond just leave and give us that hydrogen bromide. So in this particular instance, we would form this. I'm going to put, there's the proton that we extracted. So now all we're doing is saying, well, what happens when we have conjugated systems? That's all we've done in, in this chapter, is we've extended our pi system to be this conjugated pi system. And that gives us some funny things because of the way the, uh, we can draw resonance structures, the cations we make, that positive charge <coughs> is now delocalized. Uh, rather than in this case, it's not delocalized. We have a simple carbocation. The charge can't go anywhere. In this particular instance, I drew the most stable carbocation. Uh, we don't get any kind of rearrangements. Uh, we have a secondary cation, and the most stable cation wins, and that's our product, okay? So chemistry is always about uh, energetics, what's the most stable, and it's about trying to get to lower energy. Everything's trying to get to lower energy in our chemical reactions. So then we talked about the chemistry, and we'll talk about that in just a second. The next thing I want to talk about, though, uh, and I'll just do it, instead of doing all the drawing, I'm going to go to the PowerPoint and So there's an extended pi system with six pi orbitals, okay? We have six, I'm sorry, six p orbitals combined to make this uh, long chain hexatriene, right? We have six orbitals that we make from those six p orbitals. We combine them in different ways. Couple of things, notice now, when we talk about nodes, we're only talking about nodes going in this direction. We know there's a node between the top and the bottom. That's the definition of a pi orbital. A pi orbital has that node from top to bottom. But if we look in the bonding orbital, there's no change in phase as we go across here. The next orbital, there's one change of phase right in the middle. The next orbital, notice that this change in phase is always symmetrical about the middle, okay? The next one has two nodes, three nodes, 
four notes, five notes up top, okay? Now that tells us a little bit. There's more bonding interactions than anti-bonding interactions down here. Here, all of the interactions are bonding. Here, most of them are bonding, but there's one that's anti-bonding in the middle there. That's why this is a little bit higher in energy. This one has two anti-bonding interactions. It's a little bit higher. Every time we get more anti-bonding interactions, our energy levels go up. Now, when we tie this system together, so you can think about uh, a hexatriene, I'll draw it this way. Let me see, I'll do it this way. There's a hexatriene system. We can just, there's free rotation about it, we can pull it out. But as soon as we hook that together, As soon as we hook it together, look what happens to the energy levels. As soon as we hook it together and we have a cyclic compound and all of our P orbitals go right around that circle, they can talk to each other. We make an infinite loop of where the electrons can go, right? And it changes, instead of having six energy levels, we now have four energy levels with two of them having degenerate homes for electrons, degenerate orbitals, okay? That's what aromaticity is about. And now when we put the electrons in, uh, we always start, we put in one, two, three, four, five, six. They're all bonding orbitals, okay? We talk about it being aromatic. Whenever we have a magic number, which is two, six, uh, then, if we make bigger and bigger systems, 10, 12, right? We put two in here first. This is where the 4n plus 2 rule comes in. This is the 2, and then here's the 4n. And if we made a bigger system, we would have more uh, degenerate orbitals that are bonding. We keep putting electrons in, and they're all in there, and we talk about this being aromatic, okay? Whenever we have an aromatic system that uh, as we add more and more atoms, uh, we get an extended aromatic system, but we can have anti-aromaticity too. Anti-aromaticity is when we have uh, four or eight, and what happens is we end up having unpaired electrons that have the same spin. Okay, we talk about those as being anti-aromatic compounds, and that's unfavorable. Aromaticity is favored, anti-aromaticity is disfavored. These are really stable. When they're aromatic, they're very stable compounds, okay? And then, what we've been looking at in terms of the chemistry, we're looking at how do the electrons in those highest occupied orbitals interact with compounds, and what happens when they do? We've learned now, in terms of chemistry, of electrophilic aromatic substitution. Remember, the things with all the electrons, the pi systems, those are our nucleophiles in these reactions. We make lots of different electrophiles, but those are the electrons where we should be starting the pushing of our arrows, is from those pi systems that go into uh, an electrophilic system. And then we say, what happens after that? So for these aromatic systems, whenever we use a pair of electrons to add to an aromatic system, we break up the aromaticity. That's not favorable. We can do it by using very powerful uh, sources of electrons, but then it tries to get back to aromaticity, and it does it. You have some electrophile, NO2+, for example, the nit nitro. Uh, it adds to the ring. What does it spit off? It spits off a proton. Every electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction at the end involves something pulling a proton off and re-aromatizing the compound, and then it's happy again. Okay, so that's in terms of our chemistry. So that's kind of a synopsis. We're talking about what happens when we have conjugation. We have two pi systems that can interact, okay? That causes this conjugated system where we get some kind of stability. It's, it's a funny thing, though. They're stable, but they're also reactive and they can do different reactions. And then 
when we close that conjugated system upon itself, we introduce this, uh, these degenerate orbitals and we make aromatic systems which are really stable and we have to use powerful things to get chemistry to happen. So that's kind of a synopsis. So from there, I'm just gonna stop this for a second and restart it. <laughs>